thing with symmetry. Does it really annoy you when people don't put the mugs back in the cupboard properly? Do you ever get that nagging feeling that you left the front door unlocked? You've likely had some experience with one or all of these things. And we often hear people colloquially refer to someone as OCD if they're particular about the way they like things done. But what separates a quirky person like my friend who must have his entire music collection in alphabetical order, or my niece who gets really cranky when a mug is put back in the cupboard upside down? What separates those quirks from someone who is clinically diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder? Let's take a look. Obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD, is characterised by intrusive thoughts called obsessions. Now, we all have intrusive thoughts from time to time. They're the random thoughts that just pop into your mind for no reason. They might be memories or fantasies or just bizarre questions like, I wonder if penguins have knees. Sometimes these intrusive thoughts can be pretty disturbing, like thinking about punching a stranger in the face for no particular reason. Most people can just brush off these as the strange, uncontrollable thoughts they are. Having these thoughts doesn't mean that the person is secretly a sociopath. In fact, they don't mean anything at all. They're completely normal, even the disturbing ones. But for people with OCD, they can't just brush off these thoughts. Some people with OCD feel like thinking these things is equivalent to doing these things. This is known as thought-action fusion. The person with OCD fights hard to push the intrusive thoughts out of their mind, but the harder they try, the more those thoughts stick around. For a person with OCD, the intrusive thoughts can sometimes be alleviated by performing some sort of repetitive ritualistic behaviour. These behaviours are known as compulsions. Quite often, the compulsions have little, if anything, to do with the obsession. Say, for example, if I don't lock and unlock the front door seven times, then my children might die. Other times, the obsessions and compulsions are related. For example, a fear of germs, so the person washes their hands. But for the person with OCD, they will perform this behaviour to an extremely excessive degree. They might wash their hands until their fingers bleed. Now, it's really important to realise that not everyone with OCD has both obsessions and compulsions. Some people may show only one or the other. Keep this point in mind when we talk about OCD that develops in children. Obsessions and compulsions usually fall into one of four categories, and certain types of obsessions usually result in certain types of compulsions. The first category of obsession and compulsion is to do with symmetry or exactness. This is the most common form of the disorder. The compulsions are usually performed to alleviate obsessions relating to organising things, placing them just so, or repeating certain actions like walking up and down stairs until the person feels like they've done it right. The second category relates to forbidden acts. The person may be traumatised by unrelenting sexualised thoughts, thoughts of harming themselves or harming others, or thoughts about offending God. The compulsions that go with this category of obsessions can be varied. The two may be related to each other, such as praying for hours after having thoughts that would offend God. Praying and God naturally go together. Alternatively, the obsession and the compulsion may be unrelated, such as worrying that your child is going to die at preschool if you don't lock and unlock your front door seven times. The third category of obsessions and compulsions relates to contamination. And these can be thoughts of physical or mental contamination. The person may engage in hand washing rituals to try to remove some imagined contamination. They may wear gloves to avoid contact with items that are perceived as being contaminated. Or they may engage in elaborate cleaning rituals. The fourth category of obsessions and compulsions relates to hoarding. A strong desire to collect and an inability to get rid of meaningless and sometimes unsanitary items. I'll talk more about hoarding a little bit later, as it's actually categorised as its own disorder now. Interestingly, up to 30% of people with OCD also present with tic disorder, a special form of compulsion where the person feels compelled to perform sudden repetitive body movements. This feature seems to be so common in OCD that OCD with comorbid tic disorder has become its own subtype. Another subtype is early onset OCD, where the disorder develops in childhood. 
the average age of onset for this subtype is 11 years old. The early onset subtype is much more common in males, there's a really strong genetic component, and it tends to have a poorer response to treatment than other types. Note that any obsession and any compulsion category can be seen in any of the OCD subtypes. Unlike hoarding disorder, people with OCD have a high level of insight into their own disorder. They often know that their obsessions and compulsions are irrational. They can cognitively understand that their child will not die if they don't lock and unlock the front door seven times, but they still feel compelled to perform the behaviour anyway. To not perform the compulsion would just be too distressing. To the onlooker, this aspect of OCD can seem bizarre, especially when the person reports that they do not actually want to perform the compulsion. They don't enjoy doing the compulsive behaviours. They just feel like they have to do them. This disconnect between a person's goals and their behaviours has sometimes been referred to as, quote, ego dystonia, and we'll talk about it a bit more in the next lecture. So what causes obsessive compulsive disorder? Like many other mental illnesses, studies have shown that individuals diagnosed with OCD are more likely than controls to have a first degree relative with either OCD, tic disorder or hoarding disorder. Studies in children report that genetic factors may account for up to 45 to 65% of the variance on all OCD measures. Across all age cohorts, OCD seems to have a stronger biological influence than specific phobias or social anxiety do. The tick-related and early onset subtypes in particular have a very strong genetic component. The exact genes responsible for OCD and its subtypes is still a topic of research, but the most likely genetic candidates relate to serotonin, two other neurotransmitters called GABA and glutamate, and genes relating to the brain circuit called the corticostriatal loops, which we'll talk about more in the next lecture. Alongside these genetic influences, there has been lots of research linking OCD symptoms to abnormalities in neurochemical and neurotransmitter systems. The most well studied is a proposed dysfunction with the serotonergic system. People with strong OCD symptoms tend to have hypersensitive serotonin receptors. Not surprisingly, SSRIs have been found to work really well in reducing OCD symptoms. But this doesn't seem to be due to the drug making the person happier or less anxious. Instead, what seems to be happening is that the long-term SSRI treatment down-regulates the serotonergic system. This neurochemical change takes time, so understandably, SSRIs seem to take longer to reduce OCD symptoms than reducing depressive or anxious symptoms. One interesting point that has been noted in children with OCD is that when they're asked why they're performing their rituals, the children often report that they don't know why they're doing them. They just know that they need to do them. For nearly half of all children with OCD, it seems that the obsessions only develop after repeated interrogation. Why are you doing that? Uh, I don't know. Surely you must know. Why are you doing that? I don't know doesn't seem to be a good enough reason for most adults, so the child creates a reason. This point is really important because it suggests that, at least in some paediatric OCD cases, the compulsions do not develop in order to relieve the anxiety of obsessions. In some cases, the obsessions develop as a kind of post hoc rationalisation to pacify the social scrutiny and interrogation. Some mental health professionals have questioned whether these cases would be better described as COD to reflect the directionality. The compulsions cause their distress, not the other way around. I mentioned earlier that hoarding used to be classified as a subtype of OCD. In fact, there are people with OCD and a number of other disorders that show hoarding symptoms. These include OCD, anxiety, depression and schizophrenia. But hoarding disorder has been recognised as its own disorder in DSM-5 because when a large-scale investigation was performed, less than 20% of the people who met the diagnostic criteria that was being proposed for hoarding disorder in DSM-5 actually met the criteria for OCD. Another factor that differs between OCD and hoarding is its long-term course. Whereas OCD symptoms tend to wax and wane and periods of worsening illness seem to be triggered by stress, 
Hoarding disorder is progressive and just gets worse as people age. Hoarding is much more common than other OC disorders, with between 2 and 6% of the adult population and about 2% of children meeting the clinical criteria. It tends to start in childhood or adolescence, and it shows a progressive chronic course. By the time the person is in their 20s to 30s, their lives are significantly negatively impacted. As the person ages, they become progressively more isolated as their symptoms worsen. Now, if you think all the way back to week one, it's really important not to pathologise people who just happen to fall outside of statistical and cultural norms. This is especially true with hoarding and collecting, because if we view mental health and behaviour on a spectrum, it can sometimes be difficult to draw the line between perfectly normal behaviours like collecting and pathological hoarding especially when around a third of the neurotypical adult population collects things and about 70% of neurotypical children collect things. In general, adult collectors tend to be male, free from psychiatric illness, and their homes are usually uncluttered. The items in their collection are carefully selected, organised and traded if they no longer meet the owner's intentions or goals. Hoarders, on the other hand, tend to collect and keep items with no goal or discretion. There is no order to their action, and by definition, the clutter that is created interferes with their ability to use space in the way that the rooms of their house are intended. The clutter may prevent them from sleeping in their bedroom, cooking in their kitchen, or eating in their dining room. The cognitive driver behind hoarding can be to minimise waste rather than maximise acquisition, but there is a subtype of hoarding where the person has what's known as excessive acquisition. This is quite common with another subgroup, the people who hoard animals. These tend to be very serious cases as the person feels deeply responsible for the animal's welfare, but the animals are almost always severely neglected. So what's driving and maintaining a person's hoarding behaviour? If we think about collecting from an evolutionary perspective, it would have been beneficial for our ancestors to stockpile certain resources so that they can be used at leaner times. It's possible that hoarding represents a disruption to this evolutionary tendency and a breakdown in the cognitive processes necessary to distinguish between valuable items and items with no value. This tendency has been demonstrated experimentally too. The person feels extreme distress at decision-making related to discarding objects because they can't work out if something like a chocolate wrapper is valuable or not. To avoid the distress of having to make that decision, the person just keeps the item instead. I hope that this process seems kind of familiar now. Just like the anxiety disorders that we've spoken about, people with hoarding disorder engage in the hoarding to avoid the distress associated with discarding objects. One thing that really sets hoarding disorder apart from OCD is that the person doesn't have intrusive thoughts. They also usually have little to no insight into the problems with their living conditions or sanitation problems even if these issues are blatantly obvious and explicitly pointed out to them. Remember that this can be contrasted with OCD, where the person usually understands how illogical their thoughts and behaviours are. Just like OCD, there is a very strong genetic component to hoarding disorder, with about 12% having a first-degree relative diagnosed with the disorder, and around half of their first-degree relatives showing some symptoms of hoarding. Genetics seem to contribute about 50% to a person's risk, with environment making up the other half. Some early genetic studies suggest that one of the genes on chromosome 14 may be related to hoarding and OCD with hoarding symptoms. Thanks for watching. In this lecture, we've talked about the similarities and differences between obsessive compulsive disorder and hoarding disorder. We've discussed how both seem to have a really strong genetic component, as well as some of the thoughts, feelings and metacognitive failures that occur in both disorders. In the next lecture, we're going to focus on just OCD and take a closer look at the brain circuits that seem to hold the key to this disorder.